thank you for having me. Like uh, Rabbi Meisel introduced me, my name is Avi Abelo. Uh, I actually am originally from New York City um, until my bar mitzvah. Then moved to Baltimore, Maryland and lived there for three years. My father was the principal of my high school. He was brought to Baltimore to start the high school, to found the high school. Um, and that led me to be involved in NCSY in the region that included Philadelphia. That's why I asked about, uh, about NCSY in Philly, because I remember the, the, the involvement in the Philadelphia kids at the time. Um, thank God I was blessed to make Aliyah together with my family and return back home right, to our ancestral homeland when I was 16 after my junior year. And uh, since then, I, was, uh, I served in the Army, studied in yeshiva, um, had a quick stint back in New York City when I got married to my wife. She was still in graduate school, so I went to school in New York, worked for a few years, and then after five years, I really didn't want to be in America. I wanted to be home in Israel. It was a huge compromise. Please God, when you have relationships, the most important thing about relationships is knowing how to compromise every once in a while. So that was a compromise. We'd live in, a, in, in, a, in America for a few years, finish our educations, and then we returned back to Israel. And uh, we've been there now for 22 years. We have four boys. Our oldest uh, just got married a month and a half ago in the beginning of the war, which was a whole oh, wow. different lecture series I can give, how you make a wedding in a war when it's canceled last minute. But thank God they're happily married a month and a half. Please God, and may I have asked him. Um, another son, Itai, who uh, is fighting in Gaza right now. He's in the army service, a paratrooper in the commando unit. Number three is learning. He's in the pre-military uh, yeshiva program called Mechina. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mechinot. So he's in a Mechina that's down south, down by the Gaza-Egypt border. Um, and that was actually one of the communities that was under attack on uh, Simchat Torah on October 7th. Uh, thankfully, miraculously, um, the, 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 pe the, the soldiers in the area and the residents of the communities there uh, were able to stop the terrorists and they did not get into those communities. So thankfully, his machina and the other students and families were, were not affected, but they were all evacuated from their homes. <laughs> Till this day, they're still all evacuated. They, they're not living in their communities. Um, but thankfully, my son and his machina, they're the only civilians that have moved back down there. So they're back on the Egyptian Gaza border, learning Torah and helping the, helping the, uh, the um, farmers down there with all their farms. Because right now, there are no foreign workers. All the foreign workers left. Um, and, then, uh, and then my fourth son is uh, in ninth grade. Still the only one left at home with, with me and my wife, and we live in the, in the city of Efrat. Anyone ever been to Efrat? Mm. Who here has been to Israel? Okay. All right. Been to Jerusalem? All right. Good. So Efrat, we're like 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem. Which South. Okay. We, are, we live in the Judean hills, okay. Judea and Samaria, what some people like to call the West Bank, but it's really Judea and Samaria. Um, we live past Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, and we're in between Bethlehem, Beit Lechem and Hebron, right? So down below my porch, first of all, we overlook, we see Beit Lechem, and we see Yerushalayim, and we see the Temple Mount from, from our home, from our porch. This is like life. And one of the most important stories I like to tell my kids, and when they come over with their friends and we have like uh, learning on the holiday of Shavuot, is I talk about the Book of Ruth. Does everyone remember the Book of Roots? Yeah. Where did it take place? Area. Which area? Give me the specifics. It took place in the fields of Beit Lechem. So every Shavuot, I take the kids or whoever to the porch and say, you see those fields down below? Those are the fields that the story of Root took place. It's not just a book. It's not just a story tale. It happened, and it's our history, and it's our identity, and it took place right here. So the most um, unbelievable, amazing thing about Israel, and to live there, but to visit there until you live there, is that the Torah comes to life. It's not just a storybook that you're learning stories. It's like it actually happened there. You go and you see and you visit where these things took place. And we have a, a path below our home 
that goes through um, Judea and Samaria. And it's right below, and I can point it out to you, and we can walk on it. And it's called the Path of the Patriarchs. Why do you think it's called the Path of the Patriarchs? Because that, ah, great question. So it's the path of the patriarchs because that's the path that Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, the 12 tribes used to walk on. The, the prophets, they used to walk. How do we know? Well, if, do you have a map of Israel in here, Rabbi? All right. When you get a map of Israel to look at. Here, give me a marker. Yeah, give me a marker. Give me a marker. All right. Let's say, let's go like this. Let's say, let's say this is Israel, right? This is Yerushalayim. This is Tel Aviv, all right? Everyone been to Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv? Whoever's been to Israel? Great. Now, this is Be'er Sheva, right? This is a lot. Who lived in Be'er Sheva? Who was in Be'er Sheva? Give me the name of a, of, a, of a patriarch. Avram, right? There is actually an archaeological site of Be'er Sheva. It's called the archaeological site of Be'er Sheva, where you could see the old archaeology of the old ancient city of Be'er Sheva, which again is from Tanakh times, from Torah times. That's Be'er Sheva. Here's Jerusalem. Give me some other names of cities you know from the Torah. There aren't names of cities. We talked about Beit Lechem, right? Beit Lechem's over here. Great. Hebron's over here, right? I live right over here in Ephrat. Give me something else. Beit, Beit El? We got Beit El and we have Shiloh, okay? Also, two whole, Shiloh, up, Shiloh and, Beit Lech, uh, and Beit El are up there. What do you see? It's all a line. Oh. We have a straight line through Yudan Shamron from the Torah. And again, uh, that's Be'er Sheva. So we have what here, uh, this is Ke'ilu, Yudan Shamron, or what people like to call in the news, the West Bank. But you see that the whole Torah, the whole Torah, most of the stories in the Torah that apply to Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, the 12 tribes, Hanukkah, we just celebrated. Do you know that I think if not 100%, like 99% of all the battles that the Maccabim had with the Greek Syrians were in Yehuda and Shomron. There's a community right near me in Ephrat named El Azar. You know why it's named El Azar? Because El Azar HaMaccabi was killed fighting the Greeks right over there. All right? So all of Hanukkah is connected to Yehuda and Shomron, to Judea and Samaria. Right? So important information. So how do we know the path of the patriarchs? Because it's a straight line, you could tell where they walked. And again, historically, as people walk the same path, and again, it's all mountainous areas. Here you're, it, I mean, you have mountains here in, our, in, here in Phoenix, but it's outside the city. The city right here is flat. All of you, Don Shimon, are mountains. It's mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. So when people are walking, they're going to be walking a straight line, and they're going to be do, using that straight line, that straight path, every single generation. So, ha and not only that, if you would come to me and visit me in, in the area where I live, Ephrat, it's called Gush Etzion, I could take you to the Path of the Patriarchs, and there are historical markers there for 2,000 years that remain from the Romans. Do you know why when you travel, we travel based on miles? Where does the word mile come from? comes from the Romans. That was a, a mile marker by the Romans 2,000 years ago. And it was an actual marker. It's an actual pillar in the ground. So I can take you right near my home, five minutes from my home, and there are, I think, two or three mile markers still standing from the Roman time period. And that is the path of the patriarchs. And on that path of the patriarchs, right near my home, there is an ancient mikvah, a ritual bath. Why is there an ancient mikvah on the path of the patriarchs in Gush Etzion? Why would you think? Exactly, because as Jews were walking to Jerusalem, they wanted to purify themselves. They had to purify themselves before going 
up to Harabait, to the Temple Mount. And they were coming close, just a few miles away from Jerusalem. They'd go into the, into the mikvah, into the ritual bath, and then continue walking to Jerusalem. All right? So I live this history every single day. And that's how lucky and blessed I am and to be raising my children there. That every day they're living their history. They're living their identity. They're living, we're, we're the modern Jewish people in our modern homeland. Right? Our, sorry, we're the ancient Jewish people in our modern homeland. All right? So that's just a little background on, on me. So you guys had the opportunity to watch my movie Home Game. Thoughts? Okay. It was really upsetting. It was really upsetting. The, I mean, the climax was really hard once they started burning like, the homes to get the people out. It was really hard to watch because we were looking at how young all of the class, like the soldiers, it doesn't really matter how young they are, but the fact that it was all fellow soldiers and how some of them were yelling at them, like some of those from Gush Katif were yelling at them, like we're, we're, this, like, we're the same as you. You are going to go back to your bed tonight, but we're not going to. It was really hard to watch. And then also the one clip of um, one of the guys who knew one of the soldiers, and she was trying to get him out, and he was saying, you're ruining her. Like, you, what are you turning her into? You're turning her into like, someone who's doing this to us. And it was really tough to see her, she must have been like 18 or 19, but the rest of them, like it doesn't, they're all, they're all Israeli, it's so upsetting to watch. Yeah, so um, you, you saw how we were pit brother against brother. Yeah. Great, let me get all the different comments and then, and then I'll, I'll talk about them all. Yes? Okay, so what inspired me? To produce the film. I'm writing these down so I remember. Mm -hmm. And how to get everyone together. Next. Wow. About Gush Katif? About Gush Katif or about the movie? About the movie. Or Gush Katif, I would say, as well. Right? What would I do differently? Or maybe probably, what, what's the next step for this? Uh, it's two different questions. What would I do differently? What's next step? And nobody learned handwriting from me. I hardly <laughs> write anymore. My handwriting is horrible. Um, let me ask a different question. And if everyone, or as many people as possible, can give, some, give an answer here. What was the scene that touched you the most? For whatever reason, whether for good or bad. What was the scene that touched you the most? I'm starting with you. Same scene, okay. Anyone else? Also the scene where they gave up their guns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Giving back the guns. And the scenes of everyone together? Yeah. Like the singing or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. That's singing good. together. I, I really thought it was very powerful, the speeches that different people were like giving. I put two quotes down, and it was so interesting. You know, like one of them was saying, they're not our enemy, like about all the soldiers, they're not our enemy, you, no one here has volunteered. I was like, that was really, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Powerful. That was really powerful. Like, no one here is our enemy. Right. They don't want to be here. Like, one right. Enemy. I'll add it here. Any other inspiring scenes?
burning the flag. All right. I will start by saying this. Do you remember the scene when the youth were painting the sidewalk? Yeah. Okay. Why'd you love that scene, if you don't mind me asking? How powerful and active the youth are. Do you know, remember the color they were coloring? Orange. Do you know why they were coloring? The color orange? That was the color of the, yeah, that was the color of the, of the struggle. Well, amazing. By the way, um, Rena? Hindi. Hindi, Hindi. You mind li lifting my bag up for a second? Everyone see the. Uh, yeah. This. Th I didn't just put this on. I've been walking around on my work bag with that since 2005. Have you changed backpacks since 2005? I've changed backpacks, <laughs> and that is the second ribbon. That's very impressive. Really since 2005. But I've been walking around with that orange ribbon um, because that, that just shows you how much the, um, the issue, the, the struggle uh, for Gush Katif, for the families of Gush Katif, for the youth of Gush Katif is important to me because it goes much, much deeper than just the movie and, and what you saw. And I'll get into that, and that will go back into the question of uh, what inspired me and why I made the movie. Um, so, yeah, so we started in terms of the, the, the scene of them painting the streets orange, and exactly as Rabbi Meisel said, it, that showed the power of the youth. It really was, and I think if what, it wasn't just the, the painting of, uh, of the streets orange, but I think you saw the resilience of the youth throughout throughout the movie. But yeah. Also the unity of them, because I feel especially like teenagers, like we have our fights with each other and it can get pretty intense, but that the fact that they all came together to do one thing. Yeah. And can you imagine? I mean, here you're talking about regular life. Regular life, you have petty arguments here and there, fights, disagreements. We have a saying in Hebrew called sir lachatz, a, bo a boiling pot. You're talking about them living for, I don't remember exactly the time, about half a year. And then you, the movie was the last few weeks till the last day when your whole community is about to be expelled. You're about to be kicked out of your home, your house destroyed, your community destroyed, your life totally changed. You have no, you have no clue where you're going. They had no clue where they were going to be going the next day. No clue. Just think of the psychological place where you would be on an individual level, on a family level. The stress, personal stress, family stress. And then still you, you see that togetherness. You see that w w w with all of the, the hardship that they were going through, you saw that they were focusing their energy in a positive direction as much as possible which is mind-boggling like again try to think of yourself in such a situation and think wait how would I be would I be crying in my room would I be screaming at my parents all day long would I run away like, seriously just just think I like, just think of how you deal with regular stress today and then imagine, oh my God, if I was in such a, 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 a mega stressful situation like that, how would I be? And then you see how these youth dealt with that situation in such a, a, a hard place that hopefully will never happen again to any Jew, any Jew all over the, all over the world, and especially no, no Jew in Israel, but how they were able to steal and still in that situation deal with it. So that's scene number one I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and again, the coming together, all right? The, the singing together 
it showed how the community really it, it was about unity and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the history of the Jewish uh, resettling of the Gaza Strip there were 21 Jewish communities there close to 10,000 Jews there were religious communities they were secular communities they were mixed communities and that basketball tournament you saw it's a basketball league of all 21 communities you know I don't know if, what basketball league you have here in Phoenix but I know growing up in New York and then in Baltimore there were like synagogue leagues there were school leagues whether Jewish school leagues in New York or in or in Baltimore it was a school league that I played Catholic schools because we, we were the only Jewish school in the league and other private schools so this was a basketball league for those 21 Jewish communities and the beauty of the these Gaza Jewish communities was despite the differences between them there was a great sense of unity again between the religious the secular the mixed communities real se sense of unity and you also saw that on the basketball court and through the league like they all played together in this league now I want to give some historical context to understanding Gaza because many people today especially today with Gaza in the news with the Gaza war we're dealing with they like to say oh we don't need Gaza anyway just get rid of Gaza Jews have no connection to Gaza so I just want to give some truth out there for you number one who here sings songs at their Shabbat table with their families okay Friday night I think it's Friday night and correct me if I'm wrong rabbi Friday night one of the songs that's usually sung is a song named Karibon right don't know which tune you sing familiar with Karibon all right Karibon was written by Rabbi Natan of Gaza 500 years ago so if anyone comes to you or says Jews have nothing to do in Gaza Jews have no connection to Gaza we never lived in Gaza say wait a second we sing Karibon every Shabbat. That was written by a rabbi who lived in Gaza. If you go to Gaza City, or now it's not in Gaza City, they took it out. I think it's in the Israel Museum, I think. There is um, uh, uh, mosaics, floor mosaic, from the synagogue in Gaza City. Because hundreds of years ago, there were synagogues in Gaza. Going even further back, anyone who, stu who studies Dafyomi or studies the Gemara every day, the Talmud, there are rabbis in the Talmud who lived in Gaza. All right? So put politics aside. The Jewish people have a history of living in Gaza. And that's just in order to have the correct historical context, as well as understanding the historical connection between the Jewish people and Gaza. All right? It's nothing new. And, and it's important to know because in today's uh, especially social media war against us, the Jewish people, and against Israel, that's one of the things people like to throw out there. Like, Jews, Jews besides not having any connection to, to Gaza, they say we have no connection to Israel. That's a totally different line. Okay. Um, so that's the historical context. Why did we return to Gaza? All right, let's get some, give some modern context. Well, when did we return to Gaza? In what year did Israel liberate the Gaza Strip? Which... Not 2005. That's when we le that's when we left and gave up and gave 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 it away. 1967, exactly. In the miraculous Six Day War, when the whole Arab world basically attacked Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran. All right, not every single country, but all the mo most of the most of the countries joined together to attack Israel, destroy Israel, throw us into the sea. Right. We miraculously won that war in six days. Between 1948 and 1967, Israel was not in Judea and Samaria. This was under the occupation of Jordan. Gaza, it's smaller than this, <laughs> Gaza was under the occupation of Egypt. Right? There were no Jews in here. Even, I don't know how many of you know, but even uh, the old city of Jerusalem... We were forbidden to go into. It was occupied by Jordan. 
Like, we couldn't go into the old city. We couldn't go to the Kotel. We couldn't go up to Harabayat. It, it was forbidden. A Jew even came close, because was, there was a fence in the middle of Jerusalem. A Jew came close, the Jordanian soldiers would shoot at, shoot at us. Right? Now, between 1948 and 1967, the world didn't have a problem with that. They weren't saying, oh, that's not fair. Oh, that's not right. Oh, Jerusalem also belongs to the Jews. Oh, you have to allow Jews to go to their holy site. No, the world didn't care. They weren't standing up for us. They accepted the fact that Jordan occupied it and occupied our holy city and forbid us from going there. Same thing, Egypt was in charge of Gaza. No Jews in Gaza. We weren't allowed in Gaza. Miraculous 67 war. Miraculously, we liberated Gaza from Egypt. We liberated Judea and Samaria from the Jordanians. Now, it, the Israeli government at the time knew that Gaza is a security problem. And it was the military who came up with a strategy. The best way to protect Israelis and the rest of the country is having not just having an IDF presence in Gaza, but in order to help the IDF ensure that there's no security problems in Gaza, we're going to have Jews go back and live in the Gaza Strip. And that's why the, the Jewish communities in Gaza were split into three different areas. Communities on the northern side, communities in the middle, and that was called Gush Katif, and then communities on the southern side. Because then that allowed the army to be able to better control the enemy population that we were living around. That was the reason that Israel resettled the Gaza Strip. One of the first communities to be resettled there was the community of Netzer Chazani, which you all saw in the movie, mm -hmm. right? And the woman in the movie, remember her name? Anita Tucker, oh. the older woman in the movie? She is one of the first uh, Jews to move to Netzer Chazani. She was there in the very, very beginning. She and her husband, who were originally from Brooklyn, actually, made Aliyah, and she likes to tell the story. And they were living in an absorption center in Beersheva. And then uh, someone, and again, they're, they're, they're both from Brooklyn. Not much farmland in Brooklyn, right? Anyone ever been to Brooklyn? Yes. Okay. No farmland in Brooklyn. And all of a sudden, they find out and they're told there's this new opportunity to start new communities in the Gaza Strip. And you'd be farmers. And she and her husband said, we came to Israel in order to help the Jewish people resettle our ancestral homeland. If they need us to be farmers, we're going to be farmers. And to this day, her family, her children, her grandchildren are involved in farming and produce and for, that, that shipped all over the world. Unfortunately, it was all destroyed when they lost their homes in the Gaza Strip, but they rebuilt it all. Okay, so that's a little historical perspective. Then we have giving back the guns. Why did they give back the guns? They didn't want to fight them. They didn't want to, of course, right? They didn't want to fight them. Why else? It's a deeper reason. Deeper reason, do you remember? Did you see all the cameras there? Yeah. All the media there? Mm -hmm. why, why did they do it with all the media there? Why didn't they just give back their guns? As proof. As proof? Why as proof? Proof of what? Huh? Proof that they have nothing against the army, but it's even more than that. I think they stopped them. I think they were just so willing to some of them. That way? I think some of them were against the army. The way that some of them were talking, you know. Weren't against the army, not, not, against, not against the army and not in a way to use weapons, on, but the, meaning they were talking bad about what the army was used to do in terms of removing them from their homes, but not against the army. But... Um, they gave back their guns, and even though it, it endangered their lives, because they needed guns to protect themselves, okay? But they gave back their guns because at the time, sometimes government and media work together and not to the best interests of the, interests of the people. Because if a government has a policy and it wants the people to follow the policy or support the policy, they then basically invite journalists and media pro professionals and say, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it, and this is why we need to do it. And sometimes in life, in order to get support, you have to create a boogeyman, right? Elections, for instance. You have two elected officials, two people running to be elected. Well, vote for me because I'm good, but don't only vote for me because I'm good. Vote for me because that guy is bad, bad right? That's just the way politics is played. 
And one of the things that hurt me the most is that at the time, the media and the Jewish world and the government pushed a narrative that the Jews of Gush Katif, that the settlers were going to use guns and shoot at soldiers in order to stop the disengagement from happening. And that was one of the most disgusting, despicable campaigns that caused such division in the Jewish people because people believed it. That's what was being written in the news every day. And these people in Gush Katif thought, well, the only way we can get the message across to everybody that we're, we're not going to do that. We're all Israelis. We're all brothers. We're all soldiers in the Israeli army. That specific community of Netzer Chazani and also Gush Katif, many, many of the youth, majority of them all went to the elite, elite commando units. One of the guys in the movie, who I can't even tell you who he is, he's one of the most elite units, comes from a religious family. He's in a secret, secret position, this is back then, a secret, secret position in, in the army, sent all over the world, not just in Israel, where he got permission from rabbis to eat non-kosher because of the secret missions he was on and doing for the Jewish people in the land of Israel. That's how motivated and dedicated these people were and patriotic and Zionistic. And they felt betrayed that their own government and the media were portraying them to potentially use their guns against their fellow soldiers, their fellow brothers. Because we're all brothers in the army. And we're family, whether we're actually related or not related. And that was the importance of what, of, of what they did and why it was done before the cameras. So that message would despite the despicable message pushed by the media and the government every day trying to cause division and making people hate settlers, they're against peace they're going to they're gonna shoot fellow soldiers they wanted to get the truth out there that it's all a lie we love our fellow soldiers, we're all soldiers and we're not going to use guns now I'm going to go to the other the other scene the scene of the guy screaming at the woman soldier. Now, I didn't know this when I made the movie. I only found out about this after I made the movie. That's not just some random guy screaming at some random female soldier. Those two were best friends. They traveled around the world together. And that boy who lives in Gush Katif was shocked to his core that his best friend would take part in removing him and his family from his home. And the sad thing is, not only was she sent to his community, but then you saw the scene where she was actually sent to his home. Totally random. She could have been sent to any of the 21 communities. She could have been sent to any homes. But she, a best friend of this guy, was sent to remove the family of one of her closest friends. And he was in shock. And he was hurt. And that's the real raw hurt that you see him deal with when seeing his best friend, the soldier, coming to remove him and his family from his home. And it's his mother who then in the scene when she comes to the home and tells them to leave, that then she, do you remember what she said? What was she saying when she was talking to her kids and to the soldiers? We love you, right? We love our soldiers. Yes, we love you. We love your soldiers. We're all one. And then what else did she say? She had something else very powerful. She spoke about her favorite is Jewish holidays. He goes, our favorite holiday is Israel Independence Day. We love our country. We love you. We're one people. We're one army. I don't understand how you're doing this, but we love you. And it shows you how we were pit, brother against brother, brother against sister, which what in many other countries could have easily turned into a civil war with weapons being used against one another. 
I don't know, you're in Arizona, you're from Texas. Right? You tell me, if the government came to remove you, your family, from your home with no reason, your whole community, you're being expelled for no reason, illegal migrants, we're giving them your homes, leave. Do you think Texans would leave without a fight? Arizona would leave without a fight? No one would put out, pull out their guns and whether shoot or at least warn all the officials coming that you get closer, I'm going to pull my gun. Am I wrong in saying guns would be taken out and most possibly used in that situation? In Texas or Arizona at least? I don't know about New York, but Texas or Arizona? Am I safe in saying that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So in the human nature perspective, 99 countries of the world, you would have seen a civil war take place with what happened in Israel and the Gaza Strip in the summer of 2005. But because we're the Jewish people and because we are one and we are brothers, that even when our own government and our own army that we serve in was used as a tool to expel us from our homes and destroy our communities, no guns were taken out. No matter, no matter the hurt. And that, even, even with the sadness of it all, the inspiring aspect is understanding the uniqueness of us as a people, as a nation. We are one no matter how divided we might be at any given time. No matter how stupid the argument, or no matter how, how we differenti differentiate on political issues, or on religious issues and religious level, push comes to shove, we are one people despite our divisions. And we should always, always, always prioritize remembering how united we are and not pay uh, too much attention to the divisions that divide us. We can, we're always going to be divided. I like to tell people, how many of you have a boyfriend or girlfriend in here? Good. You shouldn't have. You have a boyfriend. Good. Okay? You have, you have time. Okay? I'll give you a little secret. And I sort of touched upon this in the beginning. Uh, relationships, marriage. You don't want to marry someone exactly like you. Life will be very boring. Okay? You want to be with someone who's different with you. And believe it or not, no matter how similar someone will be to you, you're still going to have differences. That's just life. I mean, the closest thing you can have to being similar to someone is if you're a twin. And even twins have differences. Just because you're twins, just because you have the same DNA, doesn't mean you're going to have the same political thoughts, the same religious level. We're always going to have differences. And the beauty about a relationship, the beauty about a marriage, about a, a man and a woman coming together, each of us come with our differences, both biological differences and obviously whatever thoughts and, 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 and whatever. And the beauty is coming together and living life and learning how to live together and being stronger as one despite your differences. Knowing how to talk respectfully one another. Knowing how to argue respectfully with one another. Knowing how to say, you want to know something? I disagree, but okay, I respect that. And then knowing how to compromise when you have differences. So that's on a personal level. And obviously, if within two people under the same roof you have differences, when you're talking about a, a, a nation of millions of people, you're going to have tons of differences. But the beauty of the Jewish people is despite our differences, focusing on how unified we are supposed to be in order to fulfill our purpose as the people, as the Jewish people, to move forward. Now, let me go to some of the uh, burning of the flag. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. First of all, the person in the movie who burnt the flag, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've spoken with my movie. His name was Yehuda Chazani who lived in Netzer Chazani. And two or three months later, or a few months after they were expelled from their homes, he and his wife were driving down south, either to drop, down, drop off their daughter or son at, at an army base or pick them up. And he had a heart attack and died. So I think you could understand where that man, where Yehuda Chazani was, for burning the flag. He was heartbroken. 
He was heartbroken that he felt betrayed by his country, by his people, by his army, to the extent that, yes, he even burnt the flag, but it wasn't just an act of protest. Again, he died of a heart attack just two, three months later because he was really heartbroken. And I don't know how many of you are interested, oh, I do know you, in terms of the medical field, right, of going into one day. But one thing medical, uh, Western medicine has started to delve into, but not enough, if you ask me, is the impact of your psychology and your emotional well-being on your physical health as well. And unfortunately, there have been an exorbitant amount of sicknesses and cancers and deaths at a young age because of illnesses specifically from the population of the families from Gush Katif. And again, you can only imagine because of the emotional distress that they experienced and held on to some till this day or everyone to this day to a certain degree it takes a lot to overcome trauma and this is a huge type of trauma I mean for years they were living in caravans in temporary communities not knowing where they were gonna live not having a house not having a business their businesses were destroyed there, there were no jobs so economic uh, problems and frustration so hence you, it's something sad very very sad to see a fellow Jew an Israeli a patriot his own children are still serving in the army he was dropping or picking up his son or daughter from the army months afterwards but you just understand the, phys the, the, the psychological uh, state that they were in with such a sense of, of, of betrayal and, and sadness for what they had to experience what inspired me to make the movie and why did I do it? I'm just seeing if I got everything. Okay. So at the time I was working as a management consultant in the business world in Tel Aviv, uh, traveling every day from my home in Efrat. Um, my wife and I had two children at the time with the third on the way. And um, I am, ever since I was a teenager, I don't know if I mentioned this, I might have, on Shabbat, I'm very passionate about my Jewish identity, about the Jewish people, pride in my identity, being part of the Jewish people, uh, passionate about Israel. Ever since I was a kid, I was passionate about Israel. And I'm passionate about the truth. So as a teenager, I remember reading the news whenever I'd read the news. And whenever the reporting would, or listening to the news, and whenever the reporting was about Israel, I'd always go crazy because they would be saying lies and misinformation about Israel. And this is 30 years ago. I even used to write letters to friends every once in a while complaining. They just wrote this, and they just wrote this, and that's not true. Don't believe it. This is as a teenager, and I was your age. So I was also very politically active. I made Aliyah to Israel back in 1990. I was 16 years old. By the way, what time is it? How much time do we have? Yeah, ten, minutes. ten minutes. Okay, so I want to leave some so time for the, questions so also. You were a teen during the Second Intifada? So I was a teen. No. Well, Sick, the Second Intifada was in. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I was, I was a teen in 1990 when I made Aliyah. Okay. You could figure out my age. I was 16 when I made Aliyah in 1990. Go for it, all you math whizzes in here. Okay? Huh? I already know how old you are. Oh, that's right. You already know how old I <laughs> All right, so um, I was very passionate about, passionate about the truth, passionate about the Jewish people, so I was very active politically. When I lived in Israel in the early 1990s, I was out there protesting against the Oslo Peace Accords because I knew it wouldn't bring peace. I knew it would bring more war and terror and bloodshed. Just to give a little perspective, when I was in the army between 1993 and 1995, I was in Gaza. I was in Gaza City. My unit is the last unit to pull out of Gaza City. We literally packed up our base in the middle of Gaza City, and we were the last ones in there because that was during the Oslo Accords, and at the, the beginning of the Oslo Accords was Gaza and Jericho first. So Israel pulled out all the army out of the cities in Gaza. The communities still remained living there, and the army was still protecting the communities, but we were pulled out of the Arab cities, and I was in Gaza City. 
1993, when I was in Gaza, do you want to know the worst terrorism we experienced in Gaza City? Having stones thrown at us. That's the worst terror we experienced in Gaza City in 1993. At the same time, I also served in Lebanon. I also served in Judea and Samaria. And at one point, uh, me and my soldiers were in an Arab village in Samaria. Do you know how many IDF soldiers it took to be able to, to protect and control the Arab village? Give me a guess. Give me a number. Give me a guess. A few hundred. Throw a, throw a number. How many soldiers it took to control a whole Arab village in 1993? How many? 15,000. In one village? In one village? Loose. Come on. No answer. Huh? Five. Ten. Five. Four. Oh, I can't tell you. We were four IDF soldiers providing, providing security, controlling a whole Arab village. This is in Samaria. This is patrolling the streets, roadblocks when necessary. We lived on a, on a rooftop in the, middle of, in the middle of the Arab village. We used to go in and do arrests sometimes at night, together with Shabak if necessary. But it was just four of us. Do you know how many IDF soldiers it takes today to go in and do an arrest for a terrorist in an Arab village in Judea and Samaria? Hundreds. Right, Perfect. right. So I'm just showing you before the peace process. This is important. Before the peace process, we needed four soldiers to provide security. After the peace process, years later, we need hundreds. And now they have rockets. And now they have RPGs. And now they have weapons. And these are not just weapons they get illegally, but these are weapons that America has given them, that Israel has given them, that they use against us. So the peace process that we were sold was going to bring peace has brought much more war and terror, which is what I was actively screaming against back in the 1990s, saying, don't, don't pass this Oslo Accord. It's, it's horrible. It's dangerous. It's going, to, it's going to push peace further away. Same thing, 2005, when the government was planning the Gaza disengagement plan. I was very active politically, and I was out protesting. I was out there burning tires. Right? And then I was a father and working. I knew it would be a disaster. I knew it would bring, and I was telling people then, not only will it bring rockets and terror into Israel, like to me, what, what happened on October 7th is not a surprise. I knew that would happen on that 20 scale, years ago. Not huh? And any that scale? Not scale. No, no scale. But, I mean, I didn't think of scale, but no, I'm not surprised. It makes total sense. Total sense. I, we, were, we were predicting it 30 years ago. Because you have to understand, once the army thinks we can have peace with an enemy, and they don't treat it as an enemy, anything can happen. It means that their minds are not, are, are not set to fight an enemy. To this day, the Israeli army still works every day with the Palestinian Authority, treating it as potential partner in, in taking care of security issues. Palestinian Authority is not a friend. The Palestinian Authority is an enemy. Some of their units took, pl took part in the October 7th massacre. They, 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 have tr they have units training to fight. Who are they training to fight? Jordan? Who are they training to fight? They're training to fight us. So it's been an enemy since 1993, since it was created. But when our leaders are not treating it as an enemy, so your guard is down. When your guard is down and, you're not, you're, and your mindset is not there to treat it as an enemy, anything can happen. You'd like to think not anything to that scale, and yet we see to that scale. They were so disconnected from reality, that's what happened. So I was very active in protesting against it before it happened in 2005. And um, when I would be interviewed in, in, in Gaza, I, I, I didn't get to tell the whole story. I, 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 ran, I, I snuck into Gaza. Gaza at the time was closed off by the army and the police. It, uh, and, and, but Jews were trying to get in there to try to help them inside because we thought if we can get m thousands and thousands of Jews in there, then we'd be able to stop the army from removing them from their homes, which the army knew and the government knew. So that's why they closed it off to stop us from going there. And uh, I tried three times to get in. Each time I was uh, pushed back from the army and the police and sent back home. And then finally I got in. And I was in there for the last month. Said goodbye to my wife, to my two boys. My wife was six months pregnant at the time. And I just disappeared until the end to try to help stop this. Why? Because I knew it wasn't going to be a disaster just for the Jewish people in Israel. Not just for the people in Gaza. I knew it would be a disaster for world Jewry. 
Because I was telling people back then in 2005, the second the world sees the Jewish state of Israel removing Jews from their homes, destroying Jewish communities, that was going to lead to a spike in anti-Semitism. Because when people around the world who hate us see, oh, the Jews, are, the Jews are doing this bad thing to fellow Jews, we can do bad things to fellow Jews. Right? And before 2005, uh, you remember 2005, Rabbi? Anti-Semitism was pretty low. Seventh, fifth grade. Fifth grade. You remember, so you don't remember, necessarily, necessarily remember anything. The L.A. Jewish bubble. You know. L.A. Jewish bubble. Well, Anti-Semitism was pretty low. Look where we are today. Now we have today protests out in the streets supporting genocide against the Jews and killing Jews. And with the university professors openly saying, well, I'm not going to say it's bad unless I understand the context. Right? That's where we are today. And I was telling people 2005, a direct link from when the Jews do bad things to fellow Jews, that was going to be. So that's why I was protesting, and that's why I made the movie. But I did not intend to make the movie. I was an organizational psychologist working in Tel Aviv. I didn't even have a camera when I, when I snuck into Gaza. But when I got in there, people in Efrat, where I live, heard that I succeeded in getting in, and they raised money to buy me a camera. Why? Because, like I told you before, the news every day was saying that the settlers were going to use our guns and shoot and be violent against our fellow soldiers. So they bought me a camera so I could be there to actually get video footage to show everyone what really happened, so that to show what, that, what the media would be saying was lying. All right? Now, no smartphones in 2005. No video on the internet 2005, right? So all we had were camcorders. That's it. Now, when I was there, I realized there wasn't going to be any violence. And thank God, towards the end, the, the, um, the media stopped talking about the, about the settlers using violence. So I thought, hmm, I have this camera. I'm here. God gave me this camera. Let me use it. So let me start documenting this community before it's destroyed. Hopefully it won't be destroyed, but if it is. So I started running around documenting the community. And then the day came for them to be removed from their homes. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I wanted to be there in protest and be dragged out together with them, right? Because that's what I'm there, to protest. But I'm like, wait a second. God gave me this video camera. I guess I should use it. So instead, I was running around all day like a Meshuggah journalist capturing on video whatever I could of what was going on in the different homes. They were removed from their homes. I got back to my house, to my family. And I had this four hours of video footage from, my, from the camp corner. And I went to a friend of mine who's a videographer. And I said, can you make me a video clip about what happened in, in this community of Netzer Khazani. So I got a donation to, to, to pay him. He made a little clip, four minute clip. And I knew at the time, video on the internet was in its infancy. Still no video on, inter on, on websites, but I found someone who'd put the video on their server. Like I, fa I physically had to go to someone with a server <laughs> at the time. And then I found a website that would then host the video. And I got them to connect it, put the video up on this website. And then only using email, I sent out a link to this video, and it got 50,000 views in two weeks, which is pretty viral in 2005 without social media. I think 2006. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, it, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't published in 2006. I know because I was one of the first accounts to use it, and it was only when the movie was already in production. Yeah. So 2006. But yeah, I was one of the first accounts there right when it opened. Okay. Um, so I made this four-minute four clip, and I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards. Really, really powerful. Super viral. It got so much uh, support, and people w were showing so much support for, for the families of Gush Katif, what they experienced. And I'm like, oh my God, i got to make a full movie out, out of this so that people see who these people are and what they experienced. Like the four minutes just like touches upon it. So I went back to my video guy. I said, I want you to make me a movie. I, got, I have this four hours of footage. Make me a movie. He looked at me like I'm a nut. He goes, what, are you crazy? You have four hours of footage. You have no storyline. You have no character. You're shaking like a Meshuggah. I was, you're lucky I got four minutes out of it. I can't do anything else. And then he said to me the following. If you're serious about making a movie about the story of these families, go back to the families and ask them for their home video footage. I'm like, what? I'm like, how am I going to do that? Why are they going to give me their home video footage? That's the last memories of their lives. That's like gold to these families, right? And who am I? Am I a movie producer? No, I'm an organizational psychologist working in the business world at a bank. Why would they give me their home video footage? But I'm like, all right, I got to make this movie. I want Jews around the world to see what happened, to have empathy for their fellow Jews, because the division in the Jewish people at the time was sickening. People who... There, was, there were those who supported the disengagement and those who were against the disengagement. And there were synagogues and rabbis 
who were even talking in such a way badly about those who were against it. It caused her tremendous division in the Jewish people. It was horrendous. I'm like, i got to make this movie. I want to create achdut. I want to create unity. I want Jews to have empathy, regardless of their differences politically. I want them to have empathy. Like, so that's why I was, I was inspired to make the movie. So I went and I started gathering home video footage. And I gathered 80 hours of home video footage from 17 or 18 different families. And then I went back to my friend. They said, okay, make me the movie. I had no clue what was on that home video footage. And then I told them the following. I said, this is your goal. You're going to make me a movie that even the biggest leftists who supported the disengagement will watch on television without changing the channel. That's the movie I want you to make. And then he sat down and started watching the footage. And then he comes back to me and goes, Avi, they had a basketball tournament that summer. This movie is going to be about the basketball tournament. No one wants to watch a movie about people being pulled from their homes. People are going to want to watch a movie about the basketball tournament. And you know how movies are? You make a movie about one story, but it really tells the other story. And it was his brilliance that made Home Game, Home Game. And that's the movie that then went around the world. It was a huge success. Now I had no money to pay for this. I went deep into debt. And it was a month before the end, before the one year anniversary. It was the summer of 2006, okay? And I knew if we couldn't finish the movie to have it screened on the anniversary, that's it, it's gonna, it's gonna die down. Like I had to take advantage of, of, of the emotion that still existed in the Jewish world at the time. So we had an executive meeting and we, and we had two choices. Either we dropped the project because I had no money to pay or we came up with the following strategy. We finished the movie even though I have no money. We organized screenings for this movie all over the state of Israel even though we have no movie and no money. And then please God, with the ticket sales that come in for a movie not yet made in a month, I'll be able to pay some of the debt that I took out to produce the movie. So those were drop it or go deeper into debt and do something crazy. So I said to myself, this is my project. I'm like, I'm going all the way. So I went deeper into debt, hired more staff to then start making phone calls to JCCs and communities all over Israel to schedule a movie for the first year anniversary and a movie that wasn't even finished yet. Thank God we organized 80 screenings all across Israel, all the way down from Eilat to up north in the Golan Heights. He finished the movie literally the day before we had to send the DVDs to all the places, like two or three days, like it was FedExed all across the country, like the night before, two nights before. And thank God it was a huge success. I had to take out a huge marketing campaign. At the time, again, there was banner ads on websites. It was Shabbat, Parsha sheets in synagogues on Shabbat, like for two, three weeks from when the decision was made to push it. Had to get graphics made, created, designed. The whole country was talking about it. 80 screenings. There were some screenings where they called me afterwards. They said, Avi, we have a line going around the block. Can we do another screening afterwards for the people waiting? I'm like, yeah, of course. That's how home game become home game. And my final lesson to each and every one of you. First of all, now I'll give this, I'll give this story. In terms of the movie, never let anyone tell you no. If you want to do something, you want to make a difference, don't let anyone tell you no. Don't, don't let anyone burst your bubble. If it's important to you, do it. You can succeed, you can fail, but I'll promise you one thing. If you just let someone burst your bubble, you'll definitely won't succeed. <laughs> That's lesson number one. And two, don't even wait for support. Don't wait, oh, do my friends support me? Do my parents support me? Do my teachers support me? No, I'm a big believer here. Anyone ever watch the movie Field of Dreams? All right, awesome movie. <laughs> if you build it, they will come. But I am where I am today, running a, an organization and a business, pushing videos about Israel and the Jewish people around the world, because I believe in if you build it, you, they will come. If I would have waited for donations, if I would have waited for financial support, I would still be working in my consulting in Tel Aviv. But I believe it. if you do something and you make a difference and people see that, then people join you. People like joining success. People like joining when they see something tangible. So don't wait for support. Something needs to be done in your community to help a family, to help a cause, to help Israel. 
Don't wait to get any people on board. Start doing it. This is what we're doing. This is happening. Did this, did this, did this. Do you want in? You don't want in? Great. You want in? Great. Now we're bigger. Now we can do more. Don't let anyone burst your bubble. All right? And then the, fi the, fi uh, and then I'll, the, the final story. When I was a soldier, I came home from Shabbat. And I was rummaging through the, the boxes that my parents packed up from when they moved. And in the boxes, I found a homework assignment from when I was 10 years old in fourth grade. All right? And I, back then, I was learning in MDS, Manhattan Day School in Manhattan. I pulled it out. I looked at it. And I, I was shocked. It was a simple homework assignment. Ten-year-old boy. What are your three dreams to accomplish in life? That's it. Three dreams. Did I sell this on Shabbat? Dream number one. Dream number one. I want to live in Israel. Dream number two, I want to serve in the Israeli army. Dream number three, I want to be really rich so I can give a lot of tzedakah. Yeah. All right? Thank God I am blessed to say I fulfilled my first two and I'm still working <laughs> on number three. Okay? No clue if I'll ever achieve it, but it's okay. But I achieved my first two. Though. Those, those two are more important. So the question I have to ask myself and the question I want to throw out to you, all right, in, in that context, who was I? What, what, made, what made that 10-year-old boy to have the dream to live in my ancestral homeland and serve in the Israeli army? And it's very simple. First of all, I was blessed to not have the challenge of Right? I had the challenge of not having this, of being um, what's distracted by a screen, by media, by over-information. When I was bored, I used to read books. And I loved history. So I loved reading history books. Jewish history books, biblical history books, American history books, Civil War history books, Holocaust history books. Like, I, was, I, I just loved it. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Civil War. It's like, I just loved taking it in. And I learned at an early age, I was 10 years old, that it was so simple. The Jewish people were exiled and persecuted everywhere. And we were never allowed or able to defend ourselves. And here we live in a generation against, I was a kid, I was 10 years old in 1983. And I understood and appreciated the fact that we had our own Jewish state of Israel once again, which is really the third Jewish commonwealth. It's not the first time we have a Jewish state. Whenever you celebrate Israel Independence Day, Yom Ha'atzmaut, I always tell people and I put videos out there and I put memes out there saying we are 3,000 plus years old, 75 years young. All right? Internalize that. We are one of the most ancient people in the whole world. And then people say, oh, only 75 years, only because the Holocaust, the United Nations gave you a state, you don't belong there, you're occupiers. Guys, we're 3,000 plus years old. This is our third Jewish state. Our first Jewish state was the first temple. Our second Jewish state was the second temple. This is the third time. And on top of that, we are the only indigenous people in the whole world to have returned and have sovereignty in our ancestral homelands with our holy sites and able to defend ourselves. Just yesterday, I was talking to a native Navajo Indian. She told me straight out, we are so jealous of the Jews. The Navajo Indians probably are never going to have Sovereignty over their ancestral homelands with their ancestral holy sites. Never! It's probably impossible, even if they wanted to. Probably cities and towns are built all over the place. Because wherever they're leaving are, are in settlements that are not necessarily on their ancestral lands. We are! And, and what saddens me is not enough Jews, especially youth, are proud of who we are and proud of how far we've come. And proud that we are the only indigenous people to return and have sovereignty in our homeland. You hear today everyone talking about indigenous rights and oppression. We are the most oppressed people in the world. We don't talk about it. And we succeeded. We overcame our oppression. The college campuses should be praising. You're a Jew? I am so jealous of you. That should be what's talked about on college campuses today. Oh my God, you guys are oppressed. I know what the Romans did to you. I know what the Greeks did to you. I know what the Germans did to you. I know what the Arab Muslims did to you. I know what the polls did to you. And look where you are today. And you're back in your homeland. And you overcame it all. And you don't even talk about being oppressed. And you're just focused about helping the world. Oh my God, I want to be a Jew. That's what should be said on college campuses today. 
that's the truth. So that's what I want you guys to take from here. To be proud of your Jewish identity. Learn your history. Learn your Jewish history. Learn your Bible history. Start talking to your parents saying, let's go home to Israel. And if not today, the next year. If not next year, start planning it for a few years. Because we are the most blessed generation of Jews in over 2,000 years that we have our homeland. And I don't want people coming to Israel because they're running away from anti-Semitism. Right now, I was just talking to someone who's working with French Jewry. He opened up an organization like two years ago, and he said uh, about uh, Aliyah to Israel, and then only like a few families were signing up. Now it's impossible to live in France and not be affected by the anti-Semitism. They're signing up in the hundreds to move to Israel. But I don't want Jews to run away. I want Jews to run towards Israel knowing how blessed we are to live in our homeland. Because right now, just right now, Monday is a holiday here in America, right? Yeah. Christmas, right? Uh, Christmas? Uh, yeah, that's okay. 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 <laughs> 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 what is that? I grew up in New York City. New York City, one of the most exciting times of the year in New York City, just being in New York is what? Christmas time. You got Christmas tunes everywhere. You got Rockefeller Center. You got the art and radio music. You got the store music. It's like exciting and happy. I don't know how it is in Phoenix, but that's New York City, right? I mean, we've got a lot of people who are obsessed with Christmas here. Okay, obsessed, you're right? I, I just came here. I flew after I lit the eighth, eighth candle of Hanukkah with my family. Can you imagine experiencing eight days of your holiday where the whole country is celebrating it. Every single place you go, you see Hanukkiyot. Every place you go is Hanukkah music. Every place you go outdoors are Hanukkiyot and Sufganiyot in every single bakery and store. The whole country is celebrating with you. Not for a minute, not for an hour, not for a little ceremony, for eight full days. And that's the same thing for Pesach, and that's the same thing for Sukkot, and that's the same thing for Rosh Hashanah, and that's the same thing for Yom Kippur, etc., etc., etc. We're living in our natural habitat where the culture is our culture. So I just want you guys to, to, to imagine that in your heads, the difference. And please, God, may you be inspired to spread some of this excitement about the opportunity to return home together with us. Oh, fi final thing, final thing. Um, I, I very much care about the fact that um, collegiates and high school students today are not given enough information to be able to stand up for themselves against this growing anti-Semitism. Because this growing anti-Semitism, like, like I tell students, when, when there are anti-Israel protesters attacking you, right? Why are they attacking you? Are you Israeli? No. Nope. Are you involved in the political decisions in Israel that affect the conflict? Why are they attacking you? So, but, but it's a political issue, right? No. All right. Did you get that, guys? All this anti-Israel protest is anti-Semitic. They're attacking mm -hmm. Jewish students and Jewish people because they're Jews. It has nothing to do with Israel. But too many Jews don't get it. I'll t and again, I'll leave with this final story because it's really important. I'm sorry. I was on Berkeley University 12 years ago, okay? During anti-Israel apartheid week. You familiar with, yeah, with that week on college campus? Week. Did I... What are you Oh, yeah, shh. I said, that, I said that? I said this story? No, no, no. Continue. Okay. So uh, I was on Berkeley University 12 years ago. And uh, there to help the students. And we went into campus. In the middle of campus, they, they build an apartheid wall and they do a street theater. Okay? What do they do? They're dressed like Israeli soldiers with like hats and with like fake guns. And then they're pushing people to the ground, pulling their hair, like shooting at them or pointing the gun at them to make so like all the, the bystanders will see and see how evil Israel is, how evil the Jews are. Right? That's what they're doing. And then you had the Jewish students from Hillel standing there with signs, Israel wants peace, Israel created the cherry tomato, Israel is the startup nation, Israel helps countries all over the world. No, this is, okay, this is what, okay? So, then this still exists today. 
Meaning, meaning the Jewish world is on a, and still today, the Jewish world and Jewish students, you're not prepared. They're not preparing you with information because the, the, our enemies are using an argument of, of justice and that we are evil and we don't have a right to exist. And we're trying, and our arguments in the Jewish world is like, no, we're good and we're peaceful and we want peace. It's, we're playing two different games. They're playing checkers, we're playing chess. And, and students are not being provided with actual information to be able to stand up for themselves and be proud of who they are. So this is what I'm active on. We're reaching out to get students in colleges and in high schools to be able to mentor them and give them the information so that they can become more active, as what, well, whether they want to become more active and use their social media uh, channels and accounts to get information out there and impact their so social circles or just for themselves. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely follow. I know the youth are probably mostly on Instagram. So just right now, I, I try to be a little, yeah, uh, and, and TikTok. No, no, no. So, so here's the thing. To, to, to follow me and what we put out, so I'm Avi Abelo on Instagram and Pulse of Israel on Instagram. We're going to get that really going much more. Um, so sign up so you can start getting the stuff where we're going to be putting out. And if you want to be more active, let me know. Just, just message me, all right? Because we really want to bring, uh, build up a network of students, high school students and college students, to be more informed, more inspired, more proud, and more um, able to stand up for themselves and help friends in certain situations all over the place. Good. Okay? Well, we don't have able, though. Yeah, able I, I was going to make a pun. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ali. I really appreciate it. Same class. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.